Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yasudian, a consultant dermatologist based in the UK. Today I thought I will discuss about hydradenitis separativa, a relatively common condition that can be challenging and frustrating to manage. One of the best ways of optimizing treatment is to understand the mechanism of the disease process. If we then target the various steps in the etiology of the condition, we have a much better chance of success. Hydradenitis is also called acne inversa and affects about 1% of the general population. It manifests mainly in the skin folds of the armpits, groin, and under the breast. Starting around the hair follicles, inflammation evolves into painful nodules, abscesses, and at a later stage, pus discharging tunnels with sinus tracts and fistulas. A recent review in the British Journal of Dermatology analyzes the etiology of this condition. This will help us understand how we can manage it more optimally. A genetic predisposition is possible, as about 30% report a positive family history of hydrogenitis. There are two major lifestyle factors in the disease development, obesity and tobacco smoking. These, however, may not be present in every individual patient. Apart from these factors, contribution of sex hormones is also suspected. This is based on the frequently observed onset of hydradenitis after puberty and the decreased disease severity during pregnancy and after menopause. We need to understand the special characteristics of the skin affected by hydradenitis. The skin folds contain a high density of hair follicles and apocrine units. They differ from other areas by the higher temperature and moisture and reduced oxygen availability and linked to that the microbiome composition. In the skin folds of healthy individuals, there are predominantly gram-positive cocci and some anaerobic bacteria. In hydradenitis, on the other hand, there's an increased incidence of Prevotella and other anaerobes like Fusobacterium. Pathogenetically, these anaerobic bacteria may support initial hair follicle inflammation in hydradenitis. The condition starts around the hair follicle. The first event is occlusion of the follicles by keratin. The sites affected are also subject to skin friction, especially in obese patients. Mechanical stress induces skin micro-injuries with the release of cellular damage-associated proteins. This may lead to multiplication of anaerobic bacteria within the occluded hair follicles. Bacterial components are released from the damaged follicular cells, and this further stimulates inflammatory responses in local cells, especially macrophages. This mediates the release of cytokines such as interleukin-1b and tumor necrosis factor alpha. The release of the content of the ruptured hair follicles into the surrounding tissue massively boosts inflammation. The inflammation eventually leads to clinical visible dermal nodules and abscesses and sometimes sinus tracts and fistulas. Using this information, let's look at the treatment of hydrogenitis, which can be challenging. Once the skin architecture is damaged, it cannot be repaired with medications. Therefore, we need to put in great efforts to reduce any delays in diagnosis so that we can start treatment as early as possible. We can roughly categorize treatments into four categories. Lifestyle measures, systemic medications, biologics, and surgery. Combinations of these treatments may be required to achieve control of the condition. Lifestyle modification is paramount. Because obesity and increased body mass index are associated with most severe disease, weight loss is strongly advised. Smokers have a poorer prognosis and poorer treatment outcomes. Smoking cessation is therefore advised for all patients. Loose-fitting cotton garments are suggested rather than tight synthetic uh, underwears. Local antiseptics are also helpful. In a prospective study of 600 patients with axillary disease, three times daily wash with antibacterial soap, warm compressed for 10 minutes, and the application of topical antibiotics resulted in a favorable response in more than half the patients. A variety of systemic agents have been used in the management and are broadly divided into antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, hormones, retinoids, and others. Each acts on a different stage of the disease process, so a combination of these agents may be very helpful. As we've already seen, hydradenitis lesions are frequently colonized by bacteria, and antibiotics which have anti-inflammatory properties may therefore be very helpful. Topical clindamycin was shown to be effective in previous studies. 
the British Association of Dermatologists guidelines suggest that we should offer oral tetracyclines, such as doxycycline or linocycline, sometimes even in double dose, for at least 12 weeks. In moderate to severe disease, combination therapy may be more effective. Rifampicin with clindamycin is usually used for 10 to 12 weeks. Another combination consists of rifampicin, moxifloxacin, and metronidazole. Atropinum is a broad-spectrum antibiotic that has been recently demonstrated to be efficacious in hydrogenitis. It can be used to achieve a rapid improvement before surgery or other maintenance therapies, but it needs intravenous administration, and it's possible that they need inpatient admission as well, and this is not always practical. Decreasing the inflammatory component of hydrogenitis may also be beneficial. Prednisolone is a therapeutic option. In one study, in recalcitrant hydradenitis, they were treated with a low dose of 10 milligrams of prednisolone in addition to all the other treatments they were currently receiving. More than 70% of these patients had improvement when it was used for at least 4 to 12 weeks. Intralesional triamcinolone can also be effective for isolated hydradenitis lesions. The British guidelines also suggest Dapsone in those who are unresponsive to antibiotic regimes alone. The evidence for hormonal therapy is more limited. Ethinyl estradiol, noregestrol, and cyproterone acetate significantly reduced hydrogenitis severity in one study. Finasteride is a selective competitive inhibitor of 5 alpha reductase and is an antiandrogen. It can improve moderate to severe hydrogenitis within four weeks, but recurrences were reported after treatment cessation. Spironolactone has antiandrogenic properties and inhibits androgen production. In a small case series, 17 of 20 patients taking spironolactone 100 to 150 milligrams a day showed reduced severity after three months. Retinoids have long been used for hydrogenitis, despite their questionable efficacy. They may work by unblocking the follicular hyperkeratosis, the very first step in hydrogenitis pathogenesis. A recent review found a relatively high response rate to acid retin among patients. It comprised a total of 32 patients with a response rate of about 60 to 65 percent. In another study, isotretinoin was found to be beneficial with mild hydrogenitis, especially if they have acne and if the patients are younger and weigh less. It might also be helpful for patients with inflammatory, migratory, and furuncles like lesions. Anti-diabetic medications, particularly metformin, may be helpful because they inhibit the proliferation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The British guidance, again, is to consider metformin in those who have concomitant diabetes and in females with polycystic ovarian syndrome or who are pregnant. Zinc glutamate, at a dose of about 90 milligrams a day, may have potential benefit in some patients. Of the biologics, adalimumab is the only agent that has been approved by health authorities over most of the world. Infliximab is another useful alternative. There are case reports of other biologics being helpful, but the British guidelines suggest that they do not have the necessary evidence yet. Finally, surgery is also an option, but it is mainly offered by plastic surgery and other general surgeons in the UK. For mild diseases, de-roofing or laser treatment may alleviate the symptoms. Incision and drainage may be used in the acute setting for patients presenting with painful fluctuant abscesses. For severe disease, wide excision is potentially the only curative treatment. The British Association of Dermatologists guidelines suggest that we can consider extensive excision for those with hydrogenitis who have failed all medical treatment. So to summarize, we need to target the different steps in the pathogenesis to try and alleviate hydrogenitis. From my experience, a combination of agents is preferable to just one therapy. Low doses of various medications in different steps of the pathogenesis may therefore be a lot more effective. From topical antiseptics to extensive surgery, every therapeutic option may play a part in helping those with this condition. I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you for listening and bye.